Our first speaker is Bill von Hippel. He is the head of the School of Psychology at the University of Queensland. Bill came out of Yale and he got his PhD from the University of Michigan. He's published over 80 papers concerned with the evolutionary psychology, self-regulation, aging, stereotyping and prejudice. And he's a fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Berlin. Ladies and gentlemen, to help you understand why we leave our pants in the hallway, Bill von Hippel. Thank you all very much. I, I fear I'm going to come across as the nerdy academic after that introduction. I can't possibly live up to all the pants in the hallway stuff, but I'll do my best. Um, what I'd like to do, we're going to do a couple of brief scientific experiments today of which you'll be part. Uh, the first one we're going to start in a moment, but let me just give you a tiny bit of background about what this first one is about, and then we'll give it a crack. Basically, um, I'm sure, I assume that all of you are aware that there are anatomical differences between men and women. Um, <laughs> you're, you're probably quite familiar with that. But, but what you might not be aware of is the fact that there are also, as a consequence, psychological differences between men and women. Now, when I say that there are anatomical differences, th that's on average, right? There's a wide variability in what men look like and a wide bit of variability in what women look like, but there's certain differences that you can count on. And psychologically, it looks much the same, that these biological differences have actually created psychological differences. And sometimes they create these psychological differences through hormonal factors. Sometimes they create them through genetic factors. But in all cases, and all the stuff I want to discuss with you tonight, what, when I tell you that there are these psychological differences, I'm speaking in general. And I'm not saying that this is how it has to be. And so your genes don't determine you how you are. Your psychological history doesn't determine how you, is, how you are. It simply nudges you in that direction. But we'll take a look at some of those nudges and see where it takes us. Um, so what I'm first going to do is have you vote on some, uh, I'm going to show you some pictures of men and women, and I'm going to ask you to decide uh, who is more attractive in each pair. And then after we've made those decisions, I'll go through how it is that we, um, how it is that we created them and, and what these votes tell us. And basically, one of the important anatomical differences between males and females, and there are many, but one of them is the difficulty of creating offspring. Now, for men, it's, it's very easy to create a baby. Men create millions and millions of sperm every day. Um, they might as well use them as not. And if they, could find a, a friend, if they could find a friendly place to put their sperm, they've got a decent chance of creating an offspring. And really, their job could end right there. For females, for women, on the other hand, it's, it's a much more dip difficult proposition. If they decide to have a baby, they're going to be at least, a, uh, typically about nine months of gestation, which particularly in an ancestral environment where food was hard to come by was a big ask. And then in ancestral environments, you typically have anywhere from two to four years of lactation, which also is a big ask in an ancestral environment where there's not enough food to come by. I remember when my son was born, it was like watching a liposuction machine attached to my wife, just sucking the fat right out of her. It was extraordinary. And he, he's just turning into a balloon. And, this would have been a very difficult thing for our ancestors to do when they were food stressed, when they had trouble getting enough to eat. So that is an important biological difference that has led to important psychological consequences in what men and women are looking for in a partner. Because for men, it's relatively easy to reproduce, and that leads to one set of standards. For women, it's a huge effortful process to reproduce, and that, that leads to another set of standards and goals. On average, women are going to be more concerned about the quality of their partner than men are. The men, are going to <laughs> men are going to compete for the affections of women because women are providing a very important resource, a huge amount of effort and time to raise this offspring that men need only put a tiny bit amount of effort and time into, at least at the minimal level. And, so, and this is something that we'll see across the animal kingdom. It was Robert Trivers who first pointed this out in the early 70s, and it really lines up the mating strategies of pretty much almost all the animals that we know about, humans included. And so, but, but what that means is that women are looking for the perfect partner. And what that perfect partner is going to be is somebody who has great genes, because of course we know the genes are passed on to the offspring, and somebody who's going to be really helpful in 
taking care of those offspring that are, that are produced. Um, in today's world, of course, if you're a single mother, you're reasonably confident your child will grow to adulthood. But in hunter-gatherer societies, children who are born without a father present had less of a chance of surviving to adulthood. And so women are not all, they're looking for great genes in their partner, and they're also looking for somebody who's really going to be helpful and help them raise their partner. Uh, how, how are we doing? Because I'm getting to where we could really use a vote here. <laughs> um, we're good? OK. We're going to try it again. Maybe, um, do you want to control it from back there? Do you think that might give us more luck? So why don't we try that? All right, so the number will appear in a moment. All right, and then it'll, beautiful. Yay. Please. <laughs> Please push a one or a two to indicate your gender. Did it appear, did you guys see the little numbers come up? Excellent. Oh, I'm, I was starting to get a little nervous there. <laughs> All right, now I'll, I'll take over. Okay, so now, oh, she's already there. What, I, what I'm going to do, what you're going to see are two images that look awfully similar. Don't worry about exactly how they're different. Just you decide which one you find more attractive, OK? And so you'll note that one says 1A and one says 2B, and it'll be like that all the way through. As soon as I push the button, the number will again appear on the screen, and then please vote, OK? Push your clicker to see which one you find more attractive. Choose the one that you find better looking. So I'm going to go ahead and control it, OK? Perfect. So now you've got the 10 seconds to vote on your preferred image. Which of those two? And I know they look very similar. Don't worry about that. OK. We're going to go on to the next one. This is the scientific experiment I, I forewarned you about. Again, same story. Just please indicate, now that the numbers are going, which one you find more attractive. Oh, no. Did it, did it work? All right, push hard. Be strong with these clicker pads. <laughs> Something's conspiring up here. I'll leave it open, whatever it is. All right, um, let's try the next one. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push it. You'll get a number. Again, 1A if you think she's more attractive, 2B if you think she's more attractive. Are they working? OK, thank God. All right. Last one of the women we're going to rate. Same story. OK, now we're going to shift gears a little bit. You get to choose between these two guys. Sadly, neither of them are here tonight. We'll go on to the next one. All right, please vote again. Not working? Push it hard. OK. I'll start up the timer. Okay, last one. Okay, hopefully most of you were able to vote. Um, now, what do we have? What did I do here? This is actually a research project that's currently underway. That Rob and I are collaborating with a number of other people at the University of Queensland looking at the genetics of attraction. And you guys get a sneak preview of it, so to speak. And what we did is the following. The, um, whenever you saw a woman, she was morphed either with number 16 or with number 5 to 20%. So it was her actual face, 80% of the image, and then it was morphed 20% with those two extremes. Whenever you saw a man, it was morphed either with number 2 or with number 10. So you never actually saw the real people in any of those images. What you saw was morphed, images that were morphed in the two different directions. Now, the way these morphs work, this is a, what, what you see here, that's actually a long series of morphs. None of those are an actual individual. 
but they're morphing from a high testosterone face at number two all the way down to a high estrogen face at number 16. Now estrogen caps bone growth, and so what'll happen is a high estrogen face will be very round, like she is. Take number 16 as the extreme example. It causes um, people to lay down fat on the cheeks and lips, um, and it, it gives that impression of very large eyes as well. And so that's a high estrogen female face. Testosterone does lots of things, just like estrogen, but one of the things that it does is it leads to a very characteristic bone growth in the face with that big square jaw and angular face that that guy has in number two. So what we did is we manipulated the degree to which those images either communicated, in the case of females, a high estrogen female or a relatively low estrogen female, and in the case of males, a high testosterone male or a low testosterone male. So now we're going to take a look at your votes and see who it is that you prefer. And despite the debacle of actually getting a vote to happen, I'm desperately hoping you guys show us what we know to be the case in the literature so I can <laughs> continue forward with my planned lecture and I won't have to ad-lib it. Okay, so what we see here, I'm so proud of you guys, this is a relief. <laughs> what we see here is uh, a uniform preference for the female face over the uh, I'm sorry, for the, high for the high estrogen female face, the more feminine, I'll just call it the more feminine female face, we see a, a uniform preference where on average across two-thirds of the images of women, both men and women like the more feminine face than the less feminine face, than the more masculinized face. I'll come back to that. What we see in the case of the men is an... Ah, interesting. Not what I expected, you people. Um, we see among the women in this audience an even greater preference for the high masculine men. Well, I think this is revealing. And it may have something to do with the fact that it's Valentine's Day. And it, <laughs> it, it also suggests to me that a number of you women are ovulating, so you might keep that in mind. Um, the, uh, and the men show less of a preference on that one, which um, I actually wasn't quite sure what the men were going to do. Well, let's back up and talk about why this might be. Basically, although finding the perfect man is very important for women because of the effort that they put into procreation, whereas finding the perfect women is not so important for men because the act is, can be quite quick and that can be the end of your job, um, nevertheless, women are actually put in a bit of a bind. And I hate to break this to you, but I'll tell you right now, there is no such thing as the perfect man. <laughs> and, and the reason why there's no such thing is it all comes down to testosterone. Now, testosterone is both good and bad, and that's why there's no perfect solution to this problem that women have faced for millennia.